My last video focused on some of the technical conditions for the creation of markets which in turn were necessary for the development of slave economy. I'm now going to focus on the slave economy and value itself by looking at the forms of circulation and monetary forms that were induced by the slave mode of production. Again, I have to emphasize that the slave mode of production was a form of commodity production. It, in addition to having a well-developed transport system, it had well-developed money, and indeed gold and silver coinage were the specific invention of the slave mode of production, and were supported, were invented to support the relation, social relations of the slave mode of production. The first coins around 700 BC come from uh, Lydia, which is a Greek city-state in Asia Minor, and they, they, they were stata, where the, the coins were called stata, which is a unit of, of gold. And gold stata coins continued to be issued by Greek kingdoms after that. Now, there's some dispute about the nature of these um, stata coins, because it turned out that they're made of a gold-silver alloy so it undermines the theory that the origins of coins were precise and reliably weighed quantities of gold. Because if, were that the case, the king of Lydia was cheating uh, people by giving them a gold-silver alloy, which at that point no one knew how to, to determine whether it was an alloy or pure gold. Uh, you've all heard the story of Archimedes and his bath. Well... Why was he thinking about this when he was in his bath? He was thinking about it because he'd been asked by the king of Syracuse to determine whether his supposedly gold crown actually was gold. And what Archimedes had hit on was a technique by which you could test whether an object or an ingot was pure gold or gold and silver because you weigh it and you see what volume of water it displaces. Then you compare it with something you know that is gold and see what the ratio of weight to water displaced is. And then apply the same principle to um, a, a piece of silver. And by uh, detecting the variation in density, you can detect whether it's um, pure silver or pure gold. Now, that wasn't available 700 BC. So it's pretty clear that even from the start, states were issuing coins and raising revenue by the fact that the coins were not of monetary value, of, of uh, metallic value equivalent to their national face value. Another thing to note is that these are very high denomination coins and wouldn't be usable for small scale commerce. They could be used for, for paying taxes by landlords and they could be used perhaps for major purchases, but not for day-to-day um, -day trade. For that to happen, you you require silver coinage to get, come into to use for, for smaller scale transactions. And um, both Athens and Rome issued large quantities of silver coin. Uh, those are for sort of moderate scale transactions. Um, to get an idea of what you can buy with silver coins, go and have a look at the current selling price of silver dollars. Now, for petty commerce, though, you actually need copper token money. And copper token money was issued both in the Chinese Empire and in um, the Roman Empire. The Chinese Empire never used or never issued precious metal coinage, only issued uh, token uh, copper coinage. And in, in Rome, the effect of long-term inflation meant that by the fourth cent third century, uh, a large part of the um, 
denarius in circulation was a copper coin, not a, um, a silver coin. Now, the same thing happened in, in more recent times. The British penny was originally a silver coin and um, is, is now not even a copper coin. It's a copper and iron debased coin. So there's a general tendency for states that are issuing coinage to debase it over time. Not only do we see the same tendencies existing uh, with state coinage, we also see things which we tend to think are purely capitalist phenomena, like financial crises. Uh, there's a major financial crisis at 33 AD, which is reported in Tacitus and a number of other historians. So here's a wee extract from Tacitus. Hence followed a scarcity of money, a great shock being given to all credit, the current coin too, in consequence of the conviction of so many persons and the sale of their property being locked up in the imperial treasury or the public exchequer. To meet this, the Senate had directed that every creditor should have two-thirds of his capital secured on estates in Italy. Creditors, however, were not were suing in for payment in full, and it was not respectable for persons when sued to break faith. The destruction of private wealth precipitated the fall of rank and reputation, till at last the emperor interposed his aid by distributing through the banks a hundred million sesterces and allowing freedom to borrow without interest for three years, provided the borrower gave security to the state in land to double the amount. Now, that's an account of a financial crisis in AD 33, but many of the same features could have been observed in the 2008 financial crisis. A crisis of the private credit system spreading, and then this leading to a intervention by the state to to prop up the banks uh, in return for which the state acquires securities well that's the same process that capitalist states carry out now you also got profiteering in response to inflation and you got many of the same state responses so I'm, I'm quoting now from the Roman Emperor Diocletian who is about 301 AD or so. Uh, Greed raves and burns with it and sets no limit on itself. Without, without regard to the human race, it rushes to increase and augment itself, not by years or months, or else by days, but almost by hours and very moments. Some people are always eager to turn a profit, even on the blessings of the gods. They seize the abundance of the general prosperity and strangle it although they each wallow in the greatest riches with which nations could have been satisfied, they chase after personal allowances and hunt down their chiselling percentages. On their greed, provincial citizens, the logic of our shared humanity urges us to set a limit. Now that's the part of the introduction to Diocletian's decree on prices and wages, where in 301 AD, having reform the currency, he now attempts to fix a fair set of prices and wages. Again, very reminiscent of the responses, for example, of British governments uh, to inflation in the 1970s. Why am I mentioning all this? I'm wanting to counter the ignorant modern, modern impression spread by value form theorists that money, credit, banking and financial crises are specific features of capitalism. They're not. I also want to counter the idea that because value, money, credit, etc. existed in the USA before the Civil War, in the early 1800s, that that country was a capitalist and not a slave society. No, that is not evidence that it's a capitalist society. Because were you to take that as evidence that it's a capitalist society, you'd have to conclude that uh, the very paradigm of slave society, the Roman Empire, was also capitalist. So we have to look at what the distinctive features are that distinguish the structure of commodity circulation in a slave economy from 
that in a capitalist economy. And it's the structure of circulation, the form of surplus extraction, and the form of social reproduction. Now, if you've read volume two of Capital, you'll know something about the structure of the circulation process in a capitalist economy. I'm going to present this information diagrammatically here. This is a, a picture of what happens in a slave economy. You have a population of slaves working on the land and as a result of that they produce a, an agricultural product. I'm showing this in the form of amphora which are the classical containers for um, things like olive oil and wine. Now some of this is consumed by the slaves in order to feed themselves and give themselves the energy to work or some is given to them by the slave owners. And the surplus product is then marketed, marketed to the towns. And in return, the latifundia on which the slave owners live receives luxury products made in the towns and takes back some of the money that they got from selling the crops. And that share of the money then feeds out from the latifundia to the slave trade in order to purchase in new slaves. Now, the important point is that quantity circulation here is driven by the sale of the surplus alone. The latter fundia attempt to be self-sufficient in necessities and tools and buy in the absolute minimum. If you read the books which were written as guides to estate managers, these are the points they emphasise. But the purchase of slaves means that some money is necessarily involved. So they can't isolate themselves entirely. And also they want to purchase luxuries. And the third point is the surplus is primarily agrarian, with an agrarian ruling class having landed estates. Now if we contrast that with capitalism, the, the diagram doesn't apply to capitalism now. In capitalism, not only the surplus product, but the subsistence goods take the form of commodities. And the direct producers are paid in wages rather than in kind, and this constitutes a big market, the larger part of the market. Capitalist payment of wages constitute a much bigger money flow than the purchase of slaves. And the capitalist surplus is primarily urban. And now the next most important point is that the means of production are commodities in a capitalist economy. They're not produced within the firm or very exceptionally produced within the firm. They're bought in commodities. In slave economies, the main means of production is the land. And the land is developed and cleared by slave labour. It's not bought in. And typically they don't buy in much in the way of machinery. They use very primitive machinery and such machinery as they do use can be built by slave craftsmen on the estate. Now that set of characteristics, which I put forward in the case of Roman Latifundia, also apply to the plantations of the Confederacy or the, the southern states. All the essential features are there. Again, slaves are often fed from crops grown on the plantation. The main means of production was the cleared land produced free by slave labour. Um, no market was formed by the direct producers. So they didn't constitute an internal market, which is unlike the market for necessities that exists in a capitalist economy. And even the bloody architecture directly copied uh, Roman architecture. They were stating quite explicitly they were the same civilization. And when you look at the form of surplus extraction, it is again different from under capitalism. Under capitalism, the primary form of surplus extraction is what Marx calls relative surplus labor. And relative surplus labor is produced by the improvements in productivity that machinery bring about. In a slave economy, the surplus is produced by whipping people, literally. 
if you look at the, the United States slave economy, slaves were given the target number of pounds of cotton to harvest each day. For each pound that they fell short, they received one lash. And over the years, the slave owners inched up the number of pounds each slave was having to do and screwed up the level of exploit physical exploitation. So there's no use of machinery. There is just more and more intensive use of force to extract the surplus. Same applies to any slave economy. The Roman, uh, the Latin language even had special words for different types of whips that were going to be used to, to, to whip their slaves to make them produce more. And all slave economies have shackled their, um, their workers. Very limited power, use of powered machinery. In general, since the labour of slaves seems free to their masters, the masters are unwilling to invest in machinery unless there's absolutely no alternative open to them. This doesn't just depend on agricultural production, but other areas as well. It's not that they didn't have the basic technical skills to produce some sort of steam engine. For example, pumps, Roman pumps made out of bronze have been excavated, which show many of the essential features that you would need to build a steam engine. Look, look at these valves here. Poppet valves of that sort were used in some kinds of steam engines. Uh, pistons, a reciprocating mechanism. Now, it could be said that they only had bronze to do this. They couldn't cast iron, they couldn't cast steel. So they would only have been able to operate these at relatively low pressures. Um, so it might be uh, an issue to do with pressure, but there is certainly little evidence that they were interested in developing powered machinery. If you think of the early period of capitalism, pumping out mines was a key motivation for the development of the steam engine. So there's Watt's engine pumping out a mine with uh, steam in this cylinder here. Here is uh, a, a computerized reconstruction of a Roman mine pumping engine that uh, has been found, um, reconstructed from the parts which have survived. And you can see reciprocating motion, similar operation, except slaves operated, operated by muscle power. They did have some knowledge of natural power sources. The earliest windmills are the Afghan or Persian mills, which were known to the Babylon, well, they're called Afghan or Persian mills now because that's the only place they survive. But the Babylonians knew these. And basically, these are buildings with a slot in the upper floor in the direction of the prevailing wind and then a vertical axis wind turbine placed in there. And then on the ground floor, they have a mill powered by this. It only works in an area with steady prevailing wind. So Persia and Afghanistan have relatively steady wind patterns from one direction. It was never very practical around the Mediterranean where winds were much more varying. The Romans did have water wheels and they had the most effective type, which is an overshoot wheel. Um, and these tend to be late. And there is evidence that by the late Roman Empire, slaves were becoming scarce and therefore labour costs were rising. So it may be that there was some incentive in the late Roman Empire to start using labour saving machinery. Um, late Roman Gaul shows the first signs of labour saving harvesting machines known in history. Um, large farms in, in Gaul where machinery of that, that sort could be used. It's unclear to me whether the predominant form of labour on these farms was wage labour or slave labour. Certainly a lot of the historians say that by the 4th century 
there were major problems in maintaining slavery in Gaul. The, the viability of the slave economy therefore depended on constant new supplies of slave labour. And since slaves were worked to an early death and weren't allowed to marry, the slave population didn't tend to reproduce itself. And the slave economy tended to wipe out its workforce. And these had to be topped up by wars of conquest. And the drive to conquer new territory and capture slaves was a major motive behind Roman imperialism. Uh, when he conquered Gaul, Caesar made a huge fortune by depopulating large areas and hauling them off as slaves. So, you have to realise that in a real slave economy, there's a, a combination of forms of agriculture taking place at any one time. You have the, the slave estates proper. You have a certain number of what I'm calling yeoman farms or pe independent peasant farm, farms. You have some estates who may be using a portion of wage labour as well. So certainly wage labour was well known as an institution. And in addition, you have some tenant farming. Now, you get transition between these forms as a consequence of different events occurring. The independent peasantry were often being converted into slaves by getting into debt. And they were either became debt slaves or they lost their land and became part of Rome's urban proletariat. Um, or they might be forced to become effectively tenant farmers consist uh, in perpetuity paying off the original debt. On the other hand, when there was a shortage of slaves and the slaves couldn't be reproduced under the old system, there was a tendency for the landlord class or the slaveholding class to allow the slaves to marry and settle, set up family farms from which they had to pay rent. And these were the, this was known as the colonnade, the colonai. Uh, and most historians see this as a transitional form into feudalism. And the percentage of wage labour versus slave labour would itself depend on whether wages were high, whether it was easy to enforce the subordination of uh, people as slaves, whether more people were being captured as slaves, whether the, the kidnap trade in children was kidnapping children into slavery was going well, etc. So what you have in a real social formation is several different sets of relations of production at once. And you have a balance between them set by technology, by political struggles, by wars of conquest, etc. And these cause shifts some of them cyclical shifts, some of them random shifts between the different modes of production. But there's an exit path here. If this is what I'm drawing here is what's known as a Markov diagram, a Markov process. And with a set of probabilistic transitions like this, with a sink state there, the end result is that the system ends up in feudalism unless the expansion of territory and the capture of new slaves can go on indefinitely, which, which it can't. Uh, it's essentially, the capture of new territory and slaves ended with Trajan's conquest of Dacia in, in the second century. After that, the system would stagnate. Again, we know that the slave trade was cut off to the USA in the, 19, in the 1830s. The long-term effects of that 
didn't really work through because the civil war occurred before the real long-term effects could could be established um, but a, a precipitating factor of the civil war in the united states was the tendency of territorial expansion of slave economies the expansion of the confederacy to the west which brought into conflict with the yeoman farmers and this diagram also relates partly to the class contradictions in a slave economy you have three main contradictions between slaves and masters between slave owners and free farmers and between slaves and free farmers or free artisans and the, you have to understand the political struggles that existed in these societies as being driven by that three-cornered relationship with the major pol political struggles occurring between the free farmers and the slave owners those dominated the um, politics of Rome in the Republican period slave struggles only could break out in the form of actual slave revolts and slave wars uh, which are very rarely successful the only long-term success was in Haiti so that the dominant axis of struggle tends to be between the yeoman farmers and the slave estates and that was certainly the case in in the United States as well Th this is uh, like the previous video a background covering some portions relatively small portions of a chapter in my forthcoming book